okay welcome to lecture 3 so uh, before i start as always i'd like to pause and see if you had any questions from last time or any time so i had a doubt as to what exactly did we mean by species species so the question is what did we mean by species well thank you it's a good question and i'll explain it so when i write phi i and i call this an on vector then i imply that this is one set of fields hmm, phi 1 up to phi n and the index is kept up it's not the nth power it's just the component of the vector now supposing somebody else gives me another vector phi hat then its components are phi hat 1 up to phi hat n third person gives me another vector i'll call it phi tilde it will also have components like this Pretty soon I'll run out of hats and tildes. There are only few of those on the keyboard. So I would want a label to keep track of the different vectors that somebody has given me. The import, so therefore I put a species label here with the rule that when A is 1, then it's my original phi. When A is 2, then it's the hat. When A is 3, it's the tilde, like that. It can go on. A can take any number of values. And A has nothing to do with N. So, for each fixed a, I have a vector phi, phi a1 up to phi a n. So a is the species index. The idea why we distinguish the two indices, we could of course whenever something has two indices, we could combine them into one larger index and just relabel everything. Indices are just labels. But we want this theory to be invariant under O n rotations with respect to this index and this there is no symmetry with respect to this index. So therefore we call this the species index and this the O n index. Is that clear enough? Should I go on more about it? So yeah. So when we had the epsilon i1 i n, yeah. i1 i2 to i n yeah. and phi i1 i2 to i n without yeah. the species, yes. it was 0 because yes. that was symmetric and this is anti-symmetric. Correct. So when we have the species index, yeah. so when we permute the upper indices, we do not we do not change the species index. Also. No, we change that we have to permute the field, not the index. So, so how does that? So when I write, good, thank you. So you're asking now, how does species solve the problem that otherwise I would have got zero? So certainly I know that this is anti-symmetric under permuting an index. But I can, once I permute the index, I can permute two of these fields to bring the indices back into the original order by relabeling indices. Have you ever done such an operation? I'm surprised you got this far without doing it. Um, I can show it to you another time, maybe come to my office sometime and I'll, I'll show it to you there. The point is that when I permute this, I get a minus sign. When I permute two fields to bring the indices back into the original order, I also permute the species because I'm permuting two actual fields. The field has to, the fields all, it doesn't matter which order I'm writing them. They're classical fields. Okay. So in that case, because the species index will change after I permute it, the thing is not, doesn't come back to what it was. The normal, this usual statement is anti-symmetric times the symmetric object is zero if I sum over indices. But this is not a symmetric object under interchange of only the i indices because of the species index. That's the statement. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, when we uh, construct the potential, hmm. uh, A has to be real. Hmm. And so can we construct the potential using any isotropic tensor hmm. and contracting it with the fields such that the final answer is a scalar. Yes. Like, is this the general lesson? That's the general. we can use yeah. any uh, isotropic tensor. That's exactly right. And that's how I can get invariants. So isotropic tensor contracted with fields will be an invariant of that symmetry. And so if I want my field theory to be invariant under that symmetry, then the potential in particular should be invariant. And so each isotropic tensor will allow me a way of contracting fields to be and make an invariant. Of course, I can then take invariants and multiply them, and those are also invariants. So does this not restrict the uh, total class of potentials you might have for a given? Yeah, it doesn't restrict for a very simple reason, which I just said. You can take products of these things. 
So you can say that they are made up of only a few things, but a potential is a potential and the physics depends on its shape. So even with one field, when I write V of phi, it can be any function, right? Of course, it should be positive and so on, bounded below and going up to infinity on both sides and so on. Within that, there are infinitely many potentials I could write. So once you have more fields, then you have these invariant tensors or isotropic tensors, but still you'll have infinitely many potentials. There's actually a lot of work in this direction by people who work on something called effective field theory, which I'll refer to from time to time. Okay, now uh, before I actually start the main topic of today, I want to give a little more perspective, which maybe I should have given right at the beginning. You are seeing me doing all kind of manipulations to write the most general scalar field theory and most general theory with some symmetry and so on. Where is the physics in all this? Answer, at the moment there isn't any physics in all this. All this is motivated by physics, but I'm not giving you any physical system that actually you can uh, think about or realize or make in your lab. Maybe you can. So, ON models can be made in the lab actually. They correspond to some condensed matter systems called spin models, XY models and so on. But I'm not focusing on that aspect, why? The reason is that quantum field theory as a framework, as a formalism is really, really complicated and difficult. And the entire purpose of this course is to equip you with that framework. Okay, after that, you can apply it to problems in particle physics, in condensed matter physics, in gravity, in a very wide scope of different topics of physics. Okay, and I won't be narrowing that scope for you. I may give you some examples, but rather I want to broaden the scope so that you, when you in future encounter a problem in some aspect of theoretical physics, you won't say, oh, I'd never heard of this thing before when I learned field theory. Now you would have seen many of the possibilities, still not all but many, of the possibilities that are actually talked about with experimental realizations and so on. But in order to make this more friendly and more sort of acceptable or palatable, I will try to introduce physics examples from time to time. So today is still going to be more formalism, but I'll try to introduce some examples where you can see exactly what physical system corresponds to some Lagrangian I'm writing. Unfortunately, for the first few lectures, I'm only writing classical Lagrangians. We are not that interested in classical field theory for the purpose of my course, because quantum field theory is the real hard and challenging thing we want to learn. So, um, but I may still refer to some systems which will be described by the Lagrangians I'm writing after they are suitably quantized. So I'll try to do that from time to time. Okay. Now, I think till last time I was still talking about uh, vector models and then I talked about matrix models, didn't I? Yeah, I did. And did I talk about, okay, uh, but I was still talking about free theories. Did, we, did I even talk about potentials yet? Probably not. So today we talk about potentials. Okay, so interactions. Well, actually, we need to vector model. Say again. We actually did it. Ah, we did some interactions. Yes, that's true. That's true. We did potentials probably. Well, the seven vector model. Spontaneous yes. symmetry. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Sorry, sorry, I forgot. I have no excuse for forgetting since this is all on the web. But okay, good. I think we discussed potentials also. Um, good. So actually, uh, good. So I'll move on to a new kind of interaction. So one kind of interaction is potentials. And we discussed that last time and the takeaway message from that is that given a kinetic term, you can add a suitable potential which covers the same set of fields, whatever are in the kinetic term. And then uh, you'll be able, if you choose your potential uh, carefully, you'll be able to preserve whatever symmetry the kinetic term had and then you'll have a classical field theory with that symmetry. Then when you quantize it, you'll eventually, you'll want to preserve that symmetry also in the quantum theory, which by the way is not trivial. It may be, it may seem obvious that when I have a classical theory with the symmetry and I quantize it, the quantum theory has the same symmetry, not true in general. And there are very important and interesting examples of that, which we'll come to when we do quantum theory. Okay, but at least we should preserve the symmetry at the classical level. Otherwise the quantum theory doesn't have any chance of having that symmetry. So we should certainly preserve it. 
and so that's motivated the choice of potentials which under o, in the on model are rotationally invariant under on and in the un case they are uh, similarly invariant under unitary transformations and in the matrix model case they are made of traces of products of matrices and uh, then they are also invariant under uh, either orthogonal or unitary uh, transformations depending on the fields i chose maybe i'll quickly mention that the in the matrix model have one nice feature that you don't need to think about this isotropic tensors and invariant tensors you just take a trace of pro any product of any number of matrices all of the same type and they all transform in the same way with u and u dagger then the whole trace will be invariant always so it's a very easy way of writing interactions okay good okay so today we'll discuss a different kind which are called um, sigma modules and to mot motivate that let me start with a possible kinetic uh, with a possible lagrangian which i'll write uh, with some arbitrary coefficient uh, lambda well let's uh, call this let's call this a potential so i assume i already have a i assume i already have this term and i'm now working with a single real scalar field and now to it i'll add a term lambda uh, phi squared del mu phi del mu phi let's try this okay so one thing you should learn when you see a lagrangian is to always count the number of fields and label in your mind what kind of interaction so how many fields are there in this term four, four. so it's a quartic interaction hmm? but it's a different quartic interaction from the one which we had considered earlier which was just phi to the fourth because two of the phi's have a derivative in front okay so it's different now the question is what good is this can it preserve symmetries does it lead to interesting theories turns out it does lead to interesting theories but this one happens to be trivial so if we include this term then this whole Lagrangian is half of 1 plus 2 phi squared um, yeah. del mu phi del mu phi and lambda lambda 2 lambda phi squared yes. absolutely and uh, this is my Lagrangian and the question is can I distinguish this from a free Lagrangian and uh, I'll show you now why we can't and that gives us teaches us a new principle which you may not have encountered which is the possibility of field redefinition so it turns out that if I define phi prime now this is not a derivative it's just a different field as a very complicated function of phi turns out to be phi root 1 plus 2 lambda phi squared plus sine hyperbolic inverse root 2 lambda times phi upon 2 root 2 lambda it's a rather painful change of variables but what it does is it takes a field phi of x and gives me a new field phi prime of x okay and if i do this then i find that del mu of this new field is actually root 1 plus 2 lambda phi squared times del mu of the old field okay and that's the square root of this whole thing so therefore my lagrangian is actually equal to del mu phi prime del mu phi prime the half so what have is yes. there a mass term or doesn't matter right and be, there could be a mass term it would ha ah, good so if there's a mass term or a potential it would become very complicated after this change of variables okay but i didn't say what is the potential so i could write a very complicated potential here which will be simple afterwards or other way around I can also just think in powers of phi. So if you look in powers of phi to lowest order, uh, actually, um, you will see that phi prime is equal to phi. So the linear term of, of this 
whole messy function is just phi because you can neglect that this is half phi this one sine hyperbolic inverse will just give you root 2 lambda phi this will cancel and you will get half phi again when you add them you will find phi prime is phi so phi prime is phi plus dot 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 non-linear terms so actually you see that I have crafted it so that the mass term would go back to a mass term plus some potential terms but we are not worrying about the potential terms right now Another lesson I think in field theory which you'll all have to get used to which maybe was not there in previous courses is that in our mind we need to focus on parts of a theory and forget about other parts bring them back when we need we can't think about everything all at the same time. So you need to understand by some get some intuition when I'm working with the kinetic term and adding this term then I have not said anything about other terms so they could be there. Yeah. Yes other question. So did the with just phi, no. the Lagrangian looks like we have some interaction Correct. potential, but it, with phi dash it just a Exactly picture. the point. So how do we reconcile this? Exactly. Two? So the point is that in this way I have written the Lagrangian which looks like having a phi fourth interaction, but once I make this change of variables, it's back to being a completely free Lagrangian. Okay. Moral of this story is that when we look at a Lagrangian, we can't be sure whether the interactions are non-trivial or trivial. It turns out that this term is actually trivial, doesn't do anything to the physics. Okay. However, when we learn to calculate things in field theory, we'll see that it will change some intermediate features of the calculations. What it won't affect are the physically observable questions. Okay. I suppose in your uh, previous course, you have learned something about amplitudes, correlation functions and cross sections, S matrix. So, the S matrix will not change under a field redefinition, that is its job. But uh, correlation functions which are off shell, where I have not imposed the cut off the external legs and put the particles on shell, all these things you have done, I'm sure, because that is the key part of doing QFT1. Uh, those things might change. Hmm? The amplitudes, off shell amplitudes might change, but whatever way they change, it turns out one can prove that when you amputate the external legs and convert it to an S matrix, which is a measurable quantity, unlike the full correlation function, uh, then it doesn't change. Now, I can't give you a proof now, but if you want, either you can talk to me or you can read about it, but that's the result. And so this shows that, this, this, so this example is nice because it shows this to you quite directly. Because you see, nobody can really insist that you have to work with this field theory. They might, you, you might say, well, first I'll transform it to that and then work with it. If somebody gives you a physical system, you can always change variables and work with the transformed variables. And in the end, you're never going to observe the field phi or the field phi prime. You're going to observe something which they do. What do they do? They create some particles, they scatter, they give me a cross section. I'll go to the Hadron Collider measure that cross section. That measurement does not care about whether I describe this way or that way. Okay. Yes. Uh, this lambda, this coupling constant we are mm. defining, mm. Uh, it has to be small or large or it has to be unitless. What is its role? Doesn't matter, right? Because it went away. No, I'm general. Oh, general lambda. Yeah. Oh, very general. good, very good. General lambda's dimensions and small and large. Good. We will discuss it. We will discuss it. Give me time. And if we don't, then remind me in a lecture or two. Yes, it is important. Um, good. Okay. Now, on the other hand, this change of variables does not tell me that every interaction of this sort I might put in every field theory, for example, in a vector model is always trivial. Okay. And in fact, in general, it's not. It just happens to be that for one real scalar field, if I put a function here, I can absorb that function by a change of variables. I chose a simple function, but it's always true that if I take one real scalar field and just put a function here, it can be absorbed. But as soon as I have many, then it can't be. Again, this is a point I wanted to emphasize that physics uh, of field theory, uh, once you know one scalar field QFT, you don't know multiple scalar field QFT. That's why I'm doing these lectures to show you general scalar field theories. Hmm? They have very different properties depending on how many scalar fields and what sort of symmetries. So let's see that. So now let's consider the vector model and try a similar trick by putting i here and 
j here. Or for example, I can even make it more interesting. I can put this i, this j, and this one i, and this one j. Now it's true that when there's only one field, this reduces to my previous example. But right now, it's not obvious that it does. Okay, in this form. So, what can I say about it? Well, it turns out that this is a special, so these are non, this kind of Lagrangian turns out to be non-trivial. Instead of proving that directly, I will prove it for you indirectly by embedding it in a family of Lagrangians, all of this type, and we'll argue that uh, on what are the conditions under which those are non-trivial, okay? So for that, let's note that this can be written as half delta ij plus two lambda pi i pi j del mu pi i Yes, is this good? Hmm? The same thing? Either yes or it's no. Don't, yes. don't, please don't hedge your bets like maybe yes, maybe no, maybe today it's correct, tomorrow it's wrong. No, no. You have to define, decide quickly whether something you agree with or not, then we can move on. You agree with this. Now I'm going to give this a name and I'm going to call it GIJ of, of all the files. I won't put the argument, okay? But now I'm going to generalize to arbitrary <coughs> functions g i j of phi. Okay, so now I forget the vector model I started with. That was just a motivation. And I'm going to consider Lagrangians of this form which is to say L equals half G i j of phi del mu phi i del mu phi j. <clears throat> now we should ask ourselves, is this non-trivial and if so, when? Clearly if G i j of phi is a constant matrix uh, and also doesn't have zero eigenvalues, then I can map it back to delta i j by a simple change of variables that I hope you can see readily. Hmm? But if it's a function of phi, it's much less clear when this is good and when this is bad. The beautiful thing though, is that this has a geometrical interpretation. Okay. And uh, we are going to study the geometrical interpretation. And let me tell you first of all what it is. As a metric, so this has a geometric interpretation where G i j of phi is a metric on the space of fields. Now, I suppose you have taken general relativity one, and probably taking two now, right? Most of you. Okay, so you know what's a metric on space-time. You know what's a metric on a manifold. Well, here we take this clever point of view that the space of the scalar fields themselves, because they are vectors after all, they have some index phi, they are phi i, then that space, we start thinking of it as a geometrical manifold, okay? And in that manifold, we introduce a metric g i j. It's a bit subtle because g i j depends on the coordinates phi of the manifold, which in turn depend on space-time points, okay? Because phi are fields. So it is a non-trivial generalization of the idea of metric to the field space. Okay. Now, if I can convince you that this geometrical interpretation makes sense, then you can right away see some common sense facts about it. One of which is that metrics you already know can change their appearance by a change of variables. Here the metric will change if I make a field redefinition. So it's not surprising that the metric an example, the previous example I gave with the single scalar field appeared to have a metric on a one dimensional space. There was just one field and the metric seemed to be phi squared, one plus phi squared. Hmm. But it's a theorem that a one dimensional space doesn't have any non-trivial metric. You can always by coordinate transformations bring it back 
to a trivial metric. Simply one dimension is too little to have any geometry and you don't have any curvature. Curvature, if you remember, requires going through some closed loop. Well, you can't do that in 1D. So that's why we were able to find this change of variables, which completely removed the metric in 1D, 1D of field space. But in general, we know that you cannot take a metric which is non-trivial on a space and just find some new coordinates in which the metric is delta ij. We also know that there's a diagnostic that you can compute its curvature tensor and if that is non-zero then the space is actually geometrically non-trivial. All this we know and we can recycle some of those ideas here. So let's try to do that. Okay. Now, um, yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd like to do uh, yes. This metric are you taking it as uh, like Lorentzian? Yeah, no, we are taking it with a Euclidean signature, okay. all positive. Okay. And you can also see why. If I took it with a Lorentzian signature, then one of its eigenvalues would be negative. For that eigenvalue, the corresponding field would have this term with a minus sign in front. Okay, and that when you put it in the Hamiltonian would make it unbounded below. So we must take this to be in a regular Riemannian manifold. Okay, that's so, one of it. Yes. Could you also say that uh, this GIJ when it was defined, it already looks like a uh, like a delta IJ plus some yes. like an expansion around the Euclidean metric. That's correct. That's correct. In this form, it certainly looks like that. And it is true that a good metric should have. I mean, at least. Okay, I don't want to say it from a rigorous mathematical point of view, but from a physical point of view, any metric we want to deal with should have some limit where it looks sort of flat. And for example, the metric on a round sphere, okay, in suitable <coughs> coordinates, it will have a form delta ij plus something, such that if I take the radius of the sphere to infinity, which will be like the inverse of this parameter, then the rest of the metric will go away and the metric will turn into flat which is the statement that if I take a sphere and I scale it up to be very huge and I sit over it and look at it, it looks like flat space, like the earth looks flat to us locally. So such things we expect and it does fit. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, one nice way to understand why it's a metric, there are two or three nice ways. Uh, one way, of course, is to um, check, uh, one way first is to check the symmetries of this model. So if you see, I have rigged it up to have some vectors phi i, but let's try to understand what are the symmetries of that model. And we'll see that again, they follow the geometrical rules of a metric. Okay, for that, let's make a variation, infinitesimal variation. Phi goes to phi plus delta phi in that Lagrangian. Okay, and let's calculate the variation of the Lagrangian delta L under this variation of phi. Hmm? Whenever uh, we can choose a delta phi such that delta L is zero, then we have a symmetry. Okay, now if I do make this variation, I get several terms and now I have to be quite careful. First of all, I have to vary the phi in here, then I have to vary the phi here, then I have to vary the phi here, and I have to add all of them. Okay. But varying the phi here and here will give me the same answer because of symmetry of gij. Okay. So the first term I'll write is the variation of the first of the metric. Now I told you that the metric depends on all the phi's, and I'm varying the phi's. So it's, I have to differentiate the metric with respect to one of the phi's and vary that phi and then sum over all of them. So I'll write it as g i j comma k delta phi k. This much is the variation of g i j, do you agree? And there's of course a sum over repeated indices that you always can imagine. And then I put back the rest of it. Okay, the other term won't have a half because of what I told you. I can vary any one of these and I'll have gij in front. So there's gij times del mu phi 
hi uh, okay in my notes what i have done is just for simplicity written this as delta phi i have written as epsilon i of phi hmm? it's just the variation of phi so then this is epsilon k just you have to remember that it always depends on phi then i have del mu phi i g i j del mu phi i uh, d k epsilon j del mu phi k this is what i find and why do i find this no i think i have written something wrong here ah no sorry uh, del this is so in my notation this is epsilon j comma k okay, epsilon j is a function of phi so i differentiate it with phi k with respect to phi k and then uh, i put back phi k and there was a del mu acting on it you can see that this is the variation of that okay so there are two terms and these are the two terms and the remarkable thing is i can assemble them into a single term g i j t k epsilon j del mu phi i del mu phi k where d k of epsilon is a covariant derivative which is an ordinary derivative of epsilon plus the christoffel symbol christoffel symbol also depends on phi okay so how did we get this well if you take these two terms you can take out del mu phi del mu phi they are present here as well as here okay they have different indices but you can make them the same index and multiply one of them by a delta to bring it to the other one and then the terms that you have to collect are derivative of epsilon which is that term and then g i g uh, j comma k times epsilon okay and now if you use the symmetry of these del phi del phi which are multiplying it you will find that it's exactly the same as the christoffel symbol so christoffel symbol has three terms but two of the terms actually cancel out and that's why just this term alone gives rise to the christoffel symbol so where gamma j k l by definition is half g j m g m k l plus g m l k minus g um, k l m okay so now we feel better because this uh, whole process clearly indicates that there is some geometry just by defining the lagrangian the way we did so we are studying this lagrangian and just by choosing that lagrangian and just making an infinitesimal variation of it we get that nice form okay this nice form good so what does this tell us well uh, it tells us that uh delta l <coughs> is equal to g i j d k epsilon j times that stuff now look at this if epsilon is a vector field on the manifold and if i contract it with g i j then this upper index becomes a lower index hmm? and you know that g is covariantly constant for a manifold so it can pass through this covariant derivative because d on g is zero 
So as a result, we actually get half G I J. Um, sorry, half D K epsilon I del mu phi I del mu phi K. So that's the full variation of the Lagrangian under an infinitesimal shift of phi. Okay, I just, uh, this should have been half, which I probably got wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, what is the half you have sorry, got in the... there's no half. This is correct, I think. Yeah? No, I was saying that the half would be observed in the discoverance interface. So yeah, that well, that's just one term in it. But I think this is correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, because th this term, which has epsilon j comma k, is one of the terms in dk of epsilon mm -hmm. and this term I can certainly see that the coefficient is 1 therefore the final term has to have coefficient 1 so this is correct okay and now for a symmetry I must put delta L equals 0 okay what can I conclude from that about epsilon what possible variations of phi are allowed which leave the Lagrangian invariant that's the question so that's a condition on epsilon because epsilon remember I never chose so far it was an arbitrary function of phi and if epsilon is arbitrary then this is not zero that's then there's no symmetry uh, you never expect to have a symmetry under any old variation of a field it must be a variation of a specific type earlier we saw orthogonal unit tree so there are always a restriction what variation you can make so now what is the restriction on epsilon to make delta l equals zero very good, but how did you get there? Uh, D k epsilon i plus uh, D i epsilon. Oh, very good. Okay. So the correct statement, you would think the statement is that this is zero. We can't conclude that because this is contracted with del phi i del phi k, which is symmetric in i and k. So the only thing we can conclude is that the symmetric part of this is zero. Okay. And that is, so therefore delta L equals zero is equivalent to D k epsilon i plus di epsilon k equals 0 and as was just very nicely pointed out this is Killing's equation and it describes an isometry so we are getting better and better everything that we know about manifolds comes back to us which is really lovely okay so we conclude that this class of Lagrangians which go by the name of non-linear sigma models I'll explain in a little while why why sigma, what is sigma in this story. It's a historical thing. Uh, this class of models has a symmetry for every I continuous isometry of the metric. So now we are pretty sure that this really is a metric. Everything is fitting. And it's quite lovely that we have a field theory which has a symmetry whenever the associated field space has an isometry. It's also not very surprising in a way. Okay. In fact, we sort of know it. For example, in the vector model, the field space was just Euclidean space and the isometries of the Euclidean space are orthogonal rotations and that's why the vector model has one symmetry. It falls into place now. Yeah, questions? Anything? Oh, you haven't uh, said here. Isometry is a continuous symmetry. It means it's a it's a it's a motion on the space, or if you like, let's see how to the easiest way to do it. Basically, isometry is a continuous symmetry of the of the space. Okay, I can give you a few examples. Take a sphere. If I rotate it, this is an isometry because the sphere looks the same after rotating. But if I rotate it about this axis, that's another isometry. And if I rotate it about the third axis, that's a third isometry. So a sphere has three isometries. If you take an ellipsoid, it doesn't have three. Now it has only one, I guess. Hmm? Only the long axis you can rotate about. Anything else you try to do will change it. So, and if you take a very wobbly space, then it has no isometry. So, it's possible to have no isometry also. But in GR, the de definition of continuous isometry is that it's generated by a vector, vector which is the infinitesimal variation of phi that satisfies Killing's equation. Okay. 
So it's a killing vector. This is killing vector. Good. Yes. Is there any error about the conservation law I can produce? Uh, good. Uh, very good point. Actually, I had not thought that through. Uh, of course, if there's an isometry, then there'll be a conservation, uh, then there'll be a symmetry, therefore a conservation law. And that conservation law will have a, will be expressed by a conserved current. So what is the conserved current, I think you're asking. And there is a form for it. I just hadn't brought it uh, today. Uh, so I will think about this and tell you next time or in the notes. But there is really a conserved current for every continuous isometry. And we should be able to write it in a general way. Thank you. That's a very good observation. Sir, yes. that conserved current would be in the field space rather than a space-time continuum. No, it would be a symmetry of the field theory. Mm -hmm. So it would be a conserved current. It does, it's not, I mean, it's a conserved current just like any uh, a conserved current due to ON rotations. You know the current, conserved current for uh, U1 or ON or anything, just like that. And in fact, it should become, as a special case, it should become those conserved currents. Hmm? It, it's not something uh, exotic. Uh, okay, I'll show you some examples. You can, maybe it will become clearer with those examples. Sir, so, like what yeah. I meant was, uh, yeah. when you have the symmetries, like a, when I meant space-time symmetries, that's uh -huh. usually associated with variables like uh, momentum or energy or Yes, like yes, yes, yes. But if you have like a field space symmetry, it would be like a charge, like an electric charge kind of. But even and momentum and other such symmetries, energy, those also are expressed as uh, functions of the fields in field theory. So the conserved current from translation invariance is the stress energy or energy right. momentum tensor. So that is expressed in terms of fields. So free field theory, for example, you can write a quadratic energy momentum tensor and verify that it's conserved. And then you can take the zero mu components of it and integrate those over space and you'll get your energy and momentum and those are conserved charges. So they are time independent. Same thing will happen here. Hmm? It is true that space time and internal symmetries are different and this is an internal symmetry. Maybe that's what you were trying to say. This is an internal symmetry, though it has a space time look because of this uh, geometric look because of the way the model has been written. Now, one more question and then we can move on from this uh, model. What is the equation of motion of this nonlinear sigma model? By the way, uh, I really can't stress enough that unless you work out these, all these steps, you will have absolutely no clue what's going on. So this course is really a very demanding course where you need to work out all those steps. I won't be working them out for you. The notes might be a little more detailed than what I say here, but you'll still have to do some work and I'll keep putting in exercises, but even if they are not there, if you see something which went from one point to the next, you should tell yourself, oh, I need to work this out, otherwise I don't really know what's going on. Hmm? It's very, very important. It will get only get more so during this course. Okay, so what are the equations of motion? Well, usual story. So for equations of motion, we simply take this Lagrangian and we calculate by the Lagrange equations, del L by del phi is equal to del L by del, del mu of del mu phi. De, sorry, del mu of del L by del mu phi. You know what it is. I think while Lagrange equations are standard and you find a very nice thing. Again, it conveniently assembles itself into an elegant form. And the elegant form is this, oops, equals zero. Okay, by the way, this time, I didn't specifically say it, but this time I have not put any potential term or mass term. Hmm? Because uh, it would in general spoil the geometric interpretation. So it turns out that for the geometric interpretation, we can think of del mu phi as a vector in a manifold, but phi itself is not a vector, it's a coordinate, and there's a lot of difference between coordinate on a manifold and vector in a manifold. So uh, you could not, for example, write gij phi i phi j and say that's a mass term, that will simply break the geometrical symmetries. And one can verify that by looking at this killing equation and seeing that that will add a term which just doesn't allow it to be zero. 
Okay, so this is the equation of motion, which has come out very nicely. Now, does this look like any equation that you have seen in uh, GR? Geodesic. What equation? Geodesic. Geodesic. Geodesic equation. Very good. And in fact, all you have to do, remember, what does mu run over? Yeah, so how many are there? Four in general. Zero, one, two, and three. Let's take the special case where the field is taken independent of x, y, and z. Only depends on time. Okay. Then this will become phi double dot and this will be phi dot phi dot and this thing. Now it looks exactly like the geodesic equation where dot is with respect to the parameter along the geodesic and phi is the coordinate on the manifold. So yet another evidence that this is a geometric model. Okay, good. And <clears throat> okay, you can also um, work out the Hamiltonian of this model, that's also an interesting exercise. One small thing which happens here is that the uh, canonical momentum in this model is not phi dot anymore. If I differentiate this Lagrangian in terms with respect to phi dot to find pi, the canonical momentum, you'll see that one phi dot will go away, that will leave gij phi dot. That's a non-linear thing. So the canonical momentum is very non-linear. So this model just does have these non-linearities. That's important part of it. Now here's an amusing observation. Supposing I take the ON model, and this is somewhat uh, related to the history of how we arrived at, how people arrived at such sigma models. Uh, so we'll take this so-called Mexican hat or whatever potential uh, and write, uh, write the Lagrangian like this. Okay. You can now actually I want to call the this is A not I because A, A goes from 1 up to n plus 1. So I have this purposely chosen a model which is the O n plus 1 model instead of n, just calling it that. <coughs> Now this model, as you can see, is very well known and the field space is just the Euclidean n plus one dimensional space and it has all the ON symmetries that you would expect of that space. But now suppose we take a limit of this model where lambda goes to infinity. The coupling constant goes very large. What will happen? The best way to ask ourselves that is to think of the Hamiltonian where this is the energy term with a plus sign. If lambda is infinite, the energy of every configuration will be infinite unless, unless what? Unless, unless this quantity is zero. is zero. So this imposes a constraint phi a phi a equals a squared. What is this constraint? What geometrically, what is it? If I put such a constraint in a Euclidean space of n plus 1 dimensions? Manifold. Yeah, what, what is the constraint manifold? Somebody circle. said. Circle, not exactly a circle. It's a sphere. Yes, it's, a sphere. it's a hypersphere. Very good. So, now, just exercising little intuition, what do you think we'll end up with when we do the manipulations? Based on everything I've told you so far, I started with a model with a perfectly flat, simple field space, but I impose a hypersphere constraint. So the fields are valued now on a hypersphere. So I expect, huh? Yeah, so the hypersphere is a manifold and I expect to find the nonlinear sigma model on that hypersphere. Seems reasonable and it's easy to derive. So what you do with this is you take the last field. So A goes from one to N plus one. So you take phi plus N plus one and you call it sigma. This is the, just give it a different name and you solve it. So by saying that this is equal to A squared minus phi I phi I, where I is only allowed to run over one up to N and you take a square. Right? I solve the constraint by just taking the last variable and expressing it in terms of the first n. And that's the solution. And if I do that, 
then I immediately end up with a Lagrangian which is of this form where Gij is delta Ij plus <coughs> hmm. sorry in my notes I've called this number V change anything much and you get delta ij plus phi i phi j upon mu square minus phi k phi k now you could show this to a mathematician and ask them whether this is a metric of any space and with some effort they can show you that it's the metric of an n-dimensional hypersphere just what we expected. More to the point is that I get a sigma model because once I eliminate this, it's just the, remember once I've set the constraint this term is gone. Now I only have this term. Now I break this term into the first n terms which are the simple ones and which contribute this much to the metric and the last term which is del mu of phi n plus 1 del mu of phi n plus 1 where I have to substitute this but now I have to take a del mu so I get 1 by this square root with some factor times del mu of phi upstairs and when I collect everything it becomes that. You just have to work it out. So we get exactly what we expected but we learn an interesting lesson. What is the group of symmetries of a n-dimensional hypersphere? So what? What number? So n? Well, let's think if it works. What is the group of symmetries of a one-dimensional hypersphere that is a circle in a plane? What is the group? So, no, it's not so one. U one, which is the same as so what? So two. Uh, and the two-dimensional sphere, the kind which I can actually make and keep in my room, like a globe or something. What are the group of symmetries? It has three symmetry axes. So it's so three. Okay. So the group of symmetries of this n hypersphere is SO n plus 1. Same as the group that I had before. And it has to be, why? Because the Lagrangian is SO n plus 1 invariant and the constraint is also SO n plus 1 invariant. So I must have SO n plus 1 symmetry. But surprise, surprise, when I stare at this model, putting gij into this, what symmetry can I see with the naked eye? Only son. Because these are son indices and they are all contracted. For example, this delta ij, which is an isotropic tensor of son, will contract with these. And phi i, phi j will contract with these. And this is phi k, phi k, which is already son invariant. So the whole thing is son invariant manifestly. So how can this happen? This is a puzzle. The model has SON plus 1 symmetry, but the visible symmetry is SON, a subgroup of it. And we can see why also. We solved the constraint. We took out, we treated one variable differently from all the others. And all the others we kept symmetric. So between them there is SON symmetry. So that's why it apparently broke. But the conclusion is that the model has SO n plus 1 symmetry of which SO n subgroup is linearly realized. Or you could say that it has SON n plus 1 symmetry which is spontaneously broken to SON. Okay, Because after we have taken the fields and we have solved this equation, this is exactly what is called shifting the field to the minimum. Okay, Because we have taken the fields to have a square equal to the value of this parameter at the minimum. And 
then uh, we get a Lagrangian where the SON symmetry is visible, but secretly this Lagrangian has SON plus 1 because it always had. And this is the actually this is the nonlinear of nonlinear sigma model. It's about the nonlinearly realized symmetries. So you must have noticed that all symmetries I've discussed till now were linearly realized. Phi goes to some matrix times phi. But here, the rest of the symmetries which are SON but not in SON plus 1 are nonlinearly realized. You could also ask another question. Supposing lambda was 0. Do I have SON plus 1 or SON? Okay, sorry. I take that back. Supposing lambda, uh, so lambda is infinite. Okay, let, let me ask you that question next time. I think I have to end now. Um, Sir? Yes. What happens to the discrete ones, the other ones? Like it's an ON plus 1, right? Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, ON plus 1. So they are there. They are just nonlinearly realized. So in SON plus 1, how many generators do I have? N plus 1, N by 2. Let's calculate. Good. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, SON plus 1 has does anyone have a class now? No. So if nobody comes here we could plausibly go on but maybe somebody will come. I don't know if this room is booked or not. Can, can someone just peek outside and see if there's it would be great if we can just have a few minutes more. Very good. Okay. So SON plus 1, you know that the number of generators of SON is n n minus 1 over 2. You can just count that. So this is n plus 1 n over 2 and SON is n n minus 1 over 2. And so the difference is precisely n. So n is the number of symmetries that are nonlinearly realized. Now we can get one more illumination. This is what I was trying to say five minutes ago, but I got confused. Supposing I take this mu squared to infinity. This term drops out. Metric is delta ij. What do I have left in that limit? I just have a free Lagrangian, but for n fields. So it has only SON symmetry. So how did I lose the remaining ones? We are saying that this whole thing has SON plus 1, which has this number of generators. But if I take mu squared to infinity, then I only have this term, and it only has this number of generators. I've lost n of them. But actually, you know what those n are. They are symmetries of the ON model in the absence of a mass term. Have you read the notes yet? No. We did it in the five. no, not going to minus five. They are continuous shift. symmetries. Shift, axionic shift, the axionic symmetry, just shifting phi by a translation, and that's exactly what happens. If I take a sphere, remember mu squared is the radius of the sphere. If I take mu squared to infinity, the sphere flattens out. Now I have a Euclidean space, okay, and all the symmetries of the sphere are not visible as rotations of the Euclidean space. Some of them become translations of the. Everything fits. Good. Uh, I think there are people outside, and anyway, I think I would rather stop. And we'll I'll see you tomorrow at four in the usual place. Mondays only we are here. Tuesdays, Thursdays we are in three zero four next.